Hi, my name is Julie Ann Link, and welcome to The Music Link. This week on the Let's Link Project, I'd like to welcome Dr. Stacy Spring. Thank you so much for being here, Stacy. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> to start out, could you please share with us an overview of what you do as a professional musician? Sure. So usually when people ask me this question, I say, I do all the things. Um, so I'm currently based in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I uh, play bassoon professionally. Um, I teach at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, um, as well as Lee University in Chattanooga State. Um, I sub a lot in orchestras. Um, I play in chamber groups. Um, I also have a private studio. And then I do um, work as a teaching artist um, through the Wolf Trap Institute for Early Learning in the Arts. So wonderful. Could you tell us a bit more about where you grew up? Sure. So this is my hometown, Chattanooga, um, and it's in southeastern Tennessee. It's beautiful. Um, I, I got to move back here about five years ago, and we've been really happy since. Um, and it's um, an interesting place because there are lots of mountains and rivers and um, landscape, beautiful landscapes, but there's also sort of a growing progressive city here, um, and it has a fairly complex history, um, which, which makes it um, an interesting place to be an artist. What do you mean by a complex history? Sure. I mean, I know I think it is important to talk about the history of the place that you live. I mean, I think that's an, a really important part of, you know, being um, an artist in a community, it's learning about the community. And so um, with Chattanooga, it's um, with like most places in the United States, of course, was originally inhabited by um, Native Americans, um, originally the Muscogee and Uchi tribes, and then the Cherokee. And it was a starting point um, for the Trail of Tears when the Cherokee were forcibly removed. Um, and then after that, as the city started to become more established, um, it was kind of an industrial type of city. Um, and it was, well, the, there were some significant civil war battles here. Um, and the union, it was a, a place where um, the union was able to come in and push the Confederates back um, and it, towards the end of the civil war. Um, and then, so there's lots of monuments and, and history surrounding that um, here. And then um, post-Civil War, um, it became very industrial. And through the 20th century, um, it became the dirtiest city, <laughs> so-called in America, just in terms of pollution. Wow. And then, um, then there was this kind of like uh, resurgence, like over towards through the end of the of the 20th century um revitalizing the city um and um, turning that around and now it's become a model for sustainability and sort of like uh, urban planning and but then of course um there's uh still a lot of gentrification um it's, there's a fairly diverse population here but there's also some still some separation, if that makes yes. sense, in terms of neighborhoods. Um, there's a rich history here um, in the African-American population um, in terms of, like, um, this is the birthplace of Bessie Smith. Um, there um, was a, a strong history of, like, sort of jazz and blues music here, and so trying to preserve that um, heritage and cult those cultural traditions um, is on the minds of a lot of people. Um, and so it's just a very interesting um, place in terms of all of the different peoples that have occupied it and how they all coexist and how we move forward um, and how the arts kind of contribute to telling all of those stories. Could you tell us about Bessie Smith? Um, she's just a well-known known blues singer um, and she um, was an example, you know, for her time, of course, in terms of just being like this progressive um, female, you know, black singer uh, making a career um, in at a time when, you know, it was really difficult to do that. And, um, and so now there's a, there's a cultural center here in Chattanooga dedicated to her called the Bessie Smith Cultural Center. Um, and so um, you can learn a lot more about the history 
of um, the, the music traditions and um, everything else <laughs> related to that um, there. So that's really cool to have in the, in the town. Mm. And then two mm. mentioning Stacey about Native American history and that's so mm. important just all over America. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for sharing about that and I'm excited to read more about Chattanooga <laughs> and get a better understanding. Yeah. You should come visit. <laughs> okay Stacy. <laughs> I'm on my way. <laughs> Honestly, looking at pictures on your website, um, mm -hmm. on the Scenic Bassoons website, I was like, wow, it looks so lush and just how you described it, it looks really beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so how did you get introduced to music and the bassoon in Chattanooga? Or was that after you left or, um, yeah. Oh, no. So I, yeah, I spent um, all of my childhood in Chattanooga, born and raised and until I went to college. So um, I got involved in music pretty young. Um, I'm the youngest of three children, and so my siblings were involved. Um, and of course, being the youngest, I always wanted to do everything that they were doing. <laughs> um, so I um, started out on piano, and then I think somewhere around third grade, um, my brother was going to summer band camp. And so I went to a magnet school that was K through 12. And so we were all at the same school as well. <laughs> So I was little Bo or I was little Jessica. And, <laughs> and so all of them, we had all the same teachers. And um, and so my brother was old enough to go to the summer band camp, um, but I was not, I was only in third grade. And I had gotten a saxophone for my birthday in the third grade. Um, and that was, I asked for one because I had a crush on one of my brother's friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I got one and my, my grandpa um, helped me learn how to play it. And, and so then I wanted to go to band camp with my brother. And so, so I talked to the band director. I, according to my parents, I don't remember any of this at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but apparently I just like, you know, I just um, wasn't going to accept no for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> And so they let me go. Um, and so by the, I kind of had a little bit of a head start, you know, having the piano background and then getting involved with the saxophone a little bit earlier than most, um, most people do because you normally wait till fifth or sixth grade. Um, so I got this um, sixth grade band and I was definitely ahead of the game. And, and so then after playing um, saxophone for a year, they were like, okay, why don't you try this really hard thing? <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> called the bassoon <laughs> there, there, yes the bassoon. <laughs> figure it out <laughs> figure it out <laughs> yeah, here's a here's a fingering chart you know wow. you read bass clef already so yeah figure it out <laughs> how was that going or were you in marching band we're doing marching band too switching from sax no okay. so since it was a magnet school um we actually didn't have a football team okay um and they the educational philosophy of the school was kind of sort of like um it was based on the paideia philosophy and um like doing things like socratic method and like we had seminar every week and um and they didn't believe in like having like sort of like comp competitive like situations or like popularity contests, you know, so there was no homecoming um, or, you know, like, um, like homecoming king and queen and that kind yeah. of stuff, you know, so there was no football. Uh, we had other sports, you know, basketball and soccer, and um, there are plenty of other sports to play, but, um, and I don't know if that was just like a logistical thing mm. or like why we didn't have a football team, if that was like played into the whole like educational philosophy of the school, but for whatever reason, so uh, that meant no marching band, which I am not sad about at all. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of um, yeah. lots of early mornings and late nights, and and the bassoon though you're hanging it off the bleachers and right. <laughs> yeah. So I got out of that um, and nice. got to focus on just playing the bassoon, and um, I continued piano lessons um, throughout high school, and I um, did a little bit of dabbling um, towards the end of high school. Um, I joined like the jazz band and uh, got super obsessed with jazz and um, and blues <laughs> towards Fun. the end of my uh, high school 
career, if you want to call that a career. But <laughs> Wonderful. Could you tell us more about where you went to college and where you decided to go study music? Um, sure. So I ended up going to Brevard College, which is in North Carolina, it's the same little town where the Brevard Music Center is. Um, and it's in the mountains of North Carolina, Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, so absolutely gorgeous. And as yeah, so I guess you can tell that I like to be uh, in nature. <laughs> and, um, and so um, that was a strong pull for going to that school. It's a small liberal arts college. And at the time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I did audition for, for music schools. Um, I thought that maybe I wanted to go into music. Um, I was certainly looking for bassoon scholarships <laughs> and things yes. like that. But I also did a whole lot of other stuff in high school. And, and so I wasn't totally sold on like, I'm going to go be a musician. I knew I wanted it to be part of my life. Um, but I wasn't totally committed. Um, and so it was intimidating to me to like, when I was auditioning for music schools, like to be told like, oh, well, you're going to have to practice four hours a day and, <laughs> and things like that. Um, and I was like, oh, I don't know about that. And <laughs> that seems really difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, so I also wanted to play soccer. I was, um, I was, uh, pretty good at soccer in high school and um, and so I ended up going to Brevard because I could do both like I could be a music major and I could be a soccer player wow. and it was a small school and so somehow they made that work <laughs> um, and so I loved I mean I I loved that that little school it's still like my home I go back every opportunity that I can can get um, to go back to that area and it's just sort of like a second home. And at the time, um, the music pr program had some really fantastic teachers. It was just, I feel like it was sort of like a magic time of like, there was like the right combination of like, you know, enough good students, um, plus like these, these faculty members that were not going to be there forever because it was sort of like a, a stepping stone job. Mm -hmm. But um, like, some fa fantastic faculty that were all there at the same time that I don't regret it, you know, for a second, um, that that was my undergraduate education and not like a conservatory or, you know, some bigger music school. Um, and actually got, had a fair amount of freedom in terms of, of being able to explore um, a lot of different types of music. Um, so I was able to play in the jazz band and I was able to like do extra independent studies, like to do, to study like Latin percussion or do like, I did more advanced sight singing um, for some reason. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> they had block tuition. And so I was always taking overloads and um, it just, I think they kind of like uh, had to crack down on that later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was because of me specifically or just like people taking advantage of that, but like I would always st stack on these extra credit hours um, just to do cool stuff. Yeah. Um, and and so I really loved that about going to, to that um, school because you don't always get to do that um, if you are going to a more just, I guess, rigorous program, like with very, you know, this is, these are the classes that you take and this is how you have to do it. Um, I loved that I had a little bit of like flexibility to, to try out and explore things. Wow. Yeah. And then could you tell us more about um, after Brevard and, and uh, studying, uh, continuing your music? So, mm. Yeah. Um, so by the time I got to the end of um, the four years at Brevard, I had kind of decided, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe I want to keep doing this. Um, I had a really great um, music history professor at the school as well, and I had kind of gotten involved in, uh, she had us doing like a, a recorder consort and like early music stuff, and, um, and so I had, I was pretty good at music history stuff and academically just in terms of like writing and things like that. And so I decided, I ended up going to, to Florida State University for grad school. Um, and again, wanting to do all the things, yes. I decided to do a double master's. I don't really recommend that, <laughs> like, you know, doing those things at the same time if you're trying to do performance and an academic degree. 
um, it was a lot. Um, so I did musicology and I did um, bassoon performance at Florida State University. So. Wow. <laughs> and you decided to double masters and then on to your doctorate. Um, well, it wasn't straight on. So okay. uh, um, life happens. Um, you meet people and you get into relationships <laughs> and that affects the way that uh, the course of your life goes. Um, so towards the end of my time at Florida State, um, my um, significant other at the time, uh, well, he's still my significant other. <laughs> um, he, uh, he's a percussionist and uh, his name is Keith Lloyd. Uh, not that that really matters, but um, <laughs> it matters. It does. It matters for me to name my significant other. Uh, he was... Uh, he was in a doctoral program at Florida State, and um, before he finished, he got a job out in Abilene, Texas, um, at a small college, uh, McMurray University in Abilene, which you are familiar with because yeah. you were out in West Texas at one point. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we, or, well, he moved out there. <laughs> The, the scoop is, and you know, this is, you know, because we've been married for 13 years now, um, I can talk about this, but like <laughs> at the time we had been together for about a year and we're about to move in together. And then it was literally, literally like, okay, I'm interviewing for this job. And then like a week later, he was gone. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a really quick turnaround. <laughs> so you can imagine like, okay like oh what does this mean yes <laughs> I still had to finish my degree and um I was still I was working on finishing my musicology degree at that point um because I I just finished the the performance stuff and was almost done with musicology but I still had to write a thesis and and all of that stuff and so um I um still had to stick around for a little while and so we did the distance thing. We figured, you know, we kind of figured things out. I ended up moving to Abilene the following spring. Wow. Um, it was kind of just like, well, okay. That's what do where I I'm do going. Now? Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs> so, um, so there was kind of this, you know, this interim period um, in Abilene where mm -hmm. I was freelancing. Um, I was figuring things out. I was building a studio um, from the ground up. There were, really wasn't anybody teaching bassoon there. Um, uh, and so I was really just kind of like figuring out how, how to try to be out there in the world um, as a musician. Of course, I had to get a job. And so for about nine months, I worked <laughs> as the operations planning and logistic, logistics assistant at Peerless Manufacturing Company. And I basically was uh, in charge of like this huge spread spreadsheet and was coordinating like these big, I don't even know how to describe it, like these big pressure vessels. They, it was a gas filtration system that they manufactured. And it was in this warehouse. Like I was one of like two women that worked in this office and there were like all these like welders out in the, <laughs> in the warehouse, like welding together these pressure vessels. And then I had to like coordinate the logistics of getting them on the truck so that they could travel uh, to wherever they needed to go. Uh, Canada, Mexico, um, parts were going all over the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so I lasted about. <laughs> yeah. I lasted about nine months in that job. Wow. Um, you know, I could have stayed and maybe like I don't know. It was a corporation. Perhaps I could have like you know moved up in the in the company or something. But mm -hmm. like pretty much that was like okay. You know, the deciding factor of like, all right, this is killing my soul. I should be doing more music stuff. And by that time, I had, you know, been able to establish myself a little bit more in terms of um, playing um, in the local orchestras. Um, there were three that I regular I played in the Abilene Philharmonic and the San Angelo Symphony, and then I frequently went out to Midland to sub a lot. Um, and uh, and then I was building up the my private studio and and teaching. And then I started teaching as an adjunct um, at there's three colleges there, and so I started. Um, teaching at all the schools. And so it just kind of 
snowballed from there. Um, but then it, Keith and I, you know, we never really planned on being there for very long. It turned into seven years, eight for him. And um, I think like, um, I always had it in my mind that like, okay, well, this is only supposed to be for a couple of years. We're going to move on. He's going to get another job, um, you know, or, you know, something or I'll find, you know, another job or like I was to toying with the idea of going back to school, you know, for a doctorate. Um, so eventually um, that's what I did. I ended up um, going to University of North Texas. And so I was commuting between Abilene and Denton to complete my coursework and then I, I was usually there like three days a week um, and I had a friend that I could crash with um, <laughs> and then I'd come back to Abilene and, and do my teaching and, and gigs or, or whatever else. Um, I had started a chamber group by that time and so we were doing some fun stuff and, and cool things and, um, and so I was very much splitting my time between going back to school and still trying to maintain mm -hmm. my career uh, where I was. Um, so that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, and the driving, I was thinking, Stacey, uh, you know, it's a good chunk of time <laughs> or across that yes. state. <laughs> Abilene oh to my Denton. goodness. Yeah, if you, you know that, I mean, just, and there's nothing in between, uh, you know, there's, yeah, it's just flat. <laughs> and uh, I remember driving back from the DFW area one time and uh, there was a blizzard coming from the opposite direction, I think, from from the from the west. So I was trying to beat the blizzard back. Um, I was trying to get to Abilene before it hit. Wow. Because I and, and we knew it was coming, and but I didn't make it. And so like I'm like in the middle between Abilene and um, Dallas, and this like literally like thunder snow <laughs> like the, wow. the, uh, people were stopped on the side of the road but I didn't want to do that you know I ended up like just like following a FedEx truck um wow. you know trying to stay in their tracks you know I could very barely see anything it's on the on the phone with Keith the whole time it, I think it took me like six hours to get get home <laughs> but I made it <laughs> Yes, determined. Yeah. I'm so glad that you're okay. Um, I know that it's quite scary in any part of, you know, doing those sort of drives and extreme weather yeah. and mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. And then there, yeah, I think there was the time I was leaving Denton and went the wrong way on the interstate and didn't realize it till I was in Oklahoma. Oh, <laughs> no. Because it looks, so it's like, it, looks, oh. it looks exactly the same. Yes. And it was dark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think Auto I was pilot. on the phone. I think I was on the phone with my mom and just didn't yes. realize that I went the wrong way. And oh no! It's, so <laughs> it's like welcome to Tulsa. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And the things that we do. Yes. <laughs> it's like hi, hi, Keith. Uh, I'm just <laughs> a few hours off. <laughs> Thought it was making great yeah. time. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Um, but it was, I mean, it, so I started my doctorate in 2011 and I just finished. Wow. Uh, Congratulations. Last year. <laughs> so there was like, <laughs> I guess we'll talk more about what happened in between, but, um, I pretty much did most of, um, my coursework and then I got a job. Yes. And so then they kind of, you know, stopped everything um, in terms of like trying to finish. Um, so that's was one thing to keep in mind uh, for the students out there that might be listening or watching. Um, you know, it, it's really hard sometimes to, to manage, like trying to be in a full-time job and still finish a degree is, is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of people that do it, but mm -hmm. um, so um, after two, uh, yeah, I got a job at Stephen F. Austin State University in 2013, um, and that was a full-time position, so, um, I moved to the opposite side of the state, and, um, and then Keith and I did distance again for a year, uh, then he moved there, um, and then after three years there, we decided to move back to Chattanooga, so, and that's how we got here. 
Stacy, I appreciate you sharing too about working in that welding position, coordinating, yeah. <laughs> and then that bringing you back to music and, you know, mm -hmm. getting a deeper appreciation for like what you'd been studying and what, what you wanted to do. I think it's really helpful to hear just that process of trying something totally different and then, but bringing you back to what you really love and enjoy and, um, and how that led to further studies. And um, could you tell us a bit more about some of your teachers and how they influenced sure. you? Um, so I think, um, so back at Brevard, um, I, I talked a little bit about the faculty there and how, um, how awesome they were. Um, but my primary teacher at Brevard actually wasn't a full-time bassoonist. Um, his name was Dr. David Curry. Um, and he was primarily a clarinetist and he also directed the band, but he was a multi-instrumentalist um, and just one of those ma amazing, fabulous musicians. And um, so I think I learned so much from him just about being musical <laughs> and, um, and just making music. Uh, and of course, like, I mean, he still, you know, took me to task on learning technique. He actually, I think, I think if I remember correctly, he was at Cincinnati at the same time as Michael Burns. Um, and I think, um, I think Michael Burns may have like taught him some, I'm not sure how much he, um, Dr. Kirby like studied with Winstead or if he did, or if it was like multiple um, teachers mm. at Cincinnati. But, um, but anyway, there's, a, there's kind of like some of that, that heritage there from, from CCM. And, um, but anyway, so he um, was just a great, you know, overall human being, like he, um, he played at my wedding, you know, he, um, he would come to my soccer games, like at Brevard, <laughs> you know, like just to like be supportive, which was, which was really great. Um, and so just being like kind of in this, you know, small music program, that was really that sense of a, of a family. Um, so, and then at Florida State, I think um, Jeff Kiesecker, uh, he's just so much fun to work with. And I think going there, like coming from like being in a small program to going to a program where there's like 18 bassoonists <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm, you know, no longer the big fish in a small pond. And now I'm, you know, like um, having a lot of, catch, you know, in some ways like catching up um, from, from what some of the bassoonists had already, you know, done, um, or just like trying to like kind of figure out where my place was as a grad student. Um, and, but the thing that I loved about Florida State was just like, again, like the camaraderie and like just what it means to like have a fun studio and like make things, you know, um, make things fun. And I've always taken that with me, like, you know, just that um, idea of like, you know, it doesn't have to be this like, just intense, like scary environment, you know, all the time. And, and we have like these like bassoon studio field trips and just <laughs> all kinds of crazy shenanigans um, in, in that studio. So then being in Abilene and trying to like figure stuff out on my own, um, that was an interesting period. And so I was working and, you know, building up the studio and, and gigging and like learning a lot just from like trying to do it um, and, and then realizing gaps that I needed to fill. Um, and so before I went back to, to doctoral school at UNT, you know, I was, I went to some summer programs. I did um, two residencies at, um, at Banff um, with Frank Morelli. And he was just a wonderful teacher to work with um, to really um, go back to like fundamentals of like um, how to create a sound and like finding your voice and like finding the core sound and um, and things like that. And also just a wonderful human being to work with. And that was also a really fun experience in terms of like studio um, building and like going out hiking and, and BAMP and um, jumping into glacial lakes <laughs> and um, ice cream and um, hiking up to tea houses and having tea and scones and chocolate and things like that. Um, so, and then going back, deciding to go back to school, um, I loved 
working with uh, Kathleen Reynolds at the University of North Texas, um, such as we are. And, but also like, yeah, she might seem sweet, but she also just hears every little thing, every little detail does not let you get away with. And that was something that I really needed um, in terms of just like the, like not letting myself gloss over, you know, the, the fine details and like making sure that it, you know, that it's right. And then uh, read making was huge. Um, that was that was a huge thing for me at that time because when I went out on my own, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, without like having someone there to help me, you know, like yes. and you know, and then I'm trying to make reads for my students and and all of that, and and so going back to 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 school um, during my doctorate. Um, that was probably one of the biggest things that I took with me was really um, honing the read making practice. Mm. So, um, Could you share a bit more about some of those techniques that you learned and that, that you practice? Sure. Um, so uh, for most of my, uh, so I'm, I'm a Hertzberg person, Hertzberg girl. Uh, that's just all the way back to high school. My teacher in high school was, um, a Hertzberg guy, and um, and then I think even um, the reads that I got in undergrad that Dr. Kirby would get for me <laughs> were from Carol Cop uh, Lowe, I think, um, and she's a Hertzberg girl, and um, and so then I did some different things at Florida State just based on learning Kiesecker's style, um, and so then once I so once I got out on my own, I was kind of trying to like continue that, um, and it was sort of working for me. Um, and then I was going to these, you know, different festivals and things, and learning more from other people um, about their styles and experimenting. And like, you know, I mean, you've been through it, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, it's um, fascinating how they're all so similar but so different. <laughs> right. Yeah. So trying all the different things, I'm like, oh, wow. You know, and of course, at the same time, it's still, I'm trying, still trying to figure out, like, what do I want to sound like? I'm still trying to, you yes. know, like, who, you know, who am I as a bassoonist? Like, and what's the best setup? And do I have the right vocal? And mm -hmm. all those things. So at the same time, trying to, like, figure out the read thing. And um, yeah. And so, so then um, getting back to um, the Hertzberg style at North Texas um, and having like the like the methodology and like really having like you know working with Miss Reynolds and like her being you know very like strict and just not necessarily strict but just like rigid and uh -huh. like like this is this is how it should, mm -hmm. should work <laughs> mm. and just having that very clear methodology and, and like and that was super helpful it was great for me to like figure out a really like consistent process mm -hmm. but then I still find that like now I go a lot more on instinct and what I hear and feel teaching it you know like I you know definitely with my students want them to to go through the processes and and I and I do teach it and I um, do recommend that they you know explore and um, I'll show you my yeah that's, that's, I call this my remaking uh, cool. bible it's like everything I've ever collected about read making um and since like high school <laughs> So, and the most recent thing to put in there was Simply Reads by Lee Munoz, Dr. Lee Munoz. Wow. Um, she has a great little um, read adjustment, um, like, guide. That's amazing. Um, and very, and just perfect for, like, kind of, like, um, it's very, you know, um, accessible and relatable, like, really good for students. Um, so. I would recommend that. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, and then let's see. Oh yes, and then recently added the Banana of Life, Ryan Crapo. Oh. Um, if you're that's another. Um, if you're wanting to get into the dig deep into the Hertzberg um, style and heritage, that's a good one. So just yeah. So tons of stuff. <laughs> and I do pull it out, and I you know, 
um, every once in a while, if I'm having like a specific problem or something, I go back and, and look through all the you know different methods and see what this person does about it and what this person does about it and what are what is their solution. And I really enjoy that, like kind of like hearing the different perspectives. So even though I do use this like traditional style that, um, you know, that's sort of almost a cult. <laughs> um, I am, I am very open to, to learning from, from different way, met, ways and methods. <laughs> Stacy, could you share a bit more about your teaching philosophy and your approach to teaching music? Sure. Um, so I think it's really important to meet the student where they are. Um, and I taught students of all ages and ability levels. Um, so being a college teacher and then also being a private studio teacher um, and having to build um, studios um, in, in smaller areas where they're not just, you know, a plethora of bassoons running around <laughs> and there's challenges with instruments and things like that. So um, I very much, um, think that you know you have to to start where they are, um, and sometimes you get a student in college who may not have had the um, the same kind of good fundamental training. Mm -hmm. um, and so fundamentals, of course, <laughs> are huge. I'm, I'm big, really big into fundamentals, um, but I try to like make fundamentals a little bit more fun. <laughs> yes. Fundamentals. Um, yeah, I love that. <laughs> I'm sure that's not original. I know I got that from somewhere else, but like, um, just in terms of like, uh, like the process of doing long tones, like I refer to it as scale marinating. <laughs> so like using a drone, like, so you're like, I think of it as like, you know, cause I'm really trying to encourage students to develop, to develop, um, a sense of like, what their sound is and the core sound. And so I try to do that from sixth grade or on or whenever I get them, <laughs> you know, that's kind of like the first thing that I do is try to really develop um, the ear. And, and so using drones and like doing this, you know, sort of like doing long tones, but also doing scales at the same time. And so I call it scale marinating because like I want them to marinate like in the sound mm -hmm. um you know it's like what is your sound is it like chocolate or is it like spaghetti sauce like you know <laughs> like you marinate in the sound and and um and get the sound of the scale you know so like so that you're not all like you're listening and not necessarily glued to the tuner and and things like that um so that's just one example of just like a um I guess, I think maybe if there was anything like, I mean, I've pulled so much from so many different teachers that, you know, is not original, but maybe that might be an original phrase, scale marinating. I love that. I've yeah. never heard of you that. You heard it. You I heard it here visuals. first. <laughs> I'm like, I'm chocolate. I'm, I'm marinating in chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I love making like even when I used to teach music history a lot I used to love to make um connections to food and like um you know like recipes and like you know uh -huh. putting um uh putting pieces together like they're different like with different ingredients and, uh -huh. and things like that so yeah. <laughs> people can connect with food I mean it's like one of the you know it's like it's one of the best analogies mm -hmm. so um so fundamentals and then I think um i also try to connect with students on what their goals are um, and you know for a middle school and high school student a lot of times the focus is like whatever test they have the next week or uh, all state or things like that so I want to make sure that I am mindful of what their goals are but then at the same time I want to like sneak other stuff in there yes <laughs> um, and and try to equip them with with tools to, that makes it easier for them to conquer those those challenges um, that they're facing so that it's less of like the whole spoon feeding thing like you know let's learn you know let's learn this note by note so that you can get through the whole etude by in like six weeks from now mm -hmm. um that i don't like that <laughs> although that's sometimes what they want me to do and i'm like no we're gonna do this instead um so so there's that there's kind of like seeing what it is that they, you know, listening to them and what is it that they're trying to get out of, of the lessons. Um, why are they taking lessons? 
Um, because when you're a private teacher and you're being paid like, you know, by the student or the family, it's like you, you know, you have to especially take that into consideration because um, it's not like, you know, a college situation where someone's auditioned for, you know, a studio and there's a music degree program and there are these expectations. You know, it's a little bit of a different um, ball game. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so in college situation, and I mean, I think in middle school and high school as well, um, I try to do a, um, you know, I, I want to teach the things that I guess are expected or have been institutionalized, mm -hmm. but I also want to try to make as much room as possible for exploring other things um, and trying to um, make it fun um, and um, just make, you know, doing more things like with improv and, um, and different uh, music from different cultures. I mean, we're in this age now of really exploring different repertoire and making sure that um, everyone has an equal voice. And I think that's something that I've always strived for um, just in terms of like, I don't know, there was something in me going through music school that was just sort of like this rebel against like, I, you know, I don't want to sit in the practice room and pra practice excerpts, these 10 excerpts over and over and over again. Um, and, and so like, you know, I wanted to play music that I had fun playing and, and not to say that, like, I love playing in orchestra. I love orchestral music. And, um, you know, that that's not the issue. Um, it's the, it's the process of like, you know, why is this the process to, to be, you know, be a, Succeed, guess, or involved. like that conditioning. Yeah, right, you know, mm -hmm. and so I've, you know, like I told you, I did all, um, jazz piano, and I got, I got to explore all these different ensembles in, in college, and, um, and so I loved that, and I want to provide that for my students as well, and make sure that they don't get locked into this just one, you know, pathway, or um, this is the only way that we play the bassoon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so I love exploring different repertoire and I, um, and I try to, to bring that in, um, uh, at every level that I can, um, in my teaching. So. Could you share a bit more about coping with music performance anxiety, if that's something that you've experienced? Oh yeah. For okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> And part of it, you know, okay, so when I went to Florida State, the first time that I ever played in a master class, um, you know, with the 18, like, I think there was 18 bassoonists, something like that, some huge number, and like, of course, I'm just like, you know, um, I never really had to like, you know, I don't think I'd ever played in front of that many other bassoonists before. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, feeling that judgment or not, I mean, and I'm, you know, I was putting that on them. I mean, they probably were judging me, but like, you know, in a kind way. <laughs> Who knows? Or it's like um, a bunch of experts in a room. It's like, they all right. know how hard this is. <laughs> yeah, but so like, I literally like broke out in hives, like, <laughs> like wow. Uh, you know, like, and get, like, super red, and that, you know, it's happened to me, uh, like, on several occasions, and it doesn't really happen to me anymore, mm -hmm. um, unless I'm just, like, really uncomfortable, or I feel really unprepared, mm -hmm. then it, and, like, I know, like, because I'm, like, oh my gosh, like, my arm is turning red, so, like, that's, like, a, an indicator to me, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> like, this is a very stressful situation, um, so I think learning what my triggers were for uh -huh. sure. Um, and then, um, and then finding kind of like some routines to incorporate before performing. Um, but I think preparation has been a huge thing for me. Like the more prepared I am and the more confident that I can feel, you know, I can take that with me on, on stage. So I get really like kind of nervous when I feel unprepared. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. So 
then I think other ways of just kind of get like finding that confidence and feeling prepared is just to perform um, in different situations. Um, so mm -hmm. actually like engaging in this like teaching artist work has been a huge thing for me because like I'm just like you know being myself with like these four-year-olds and like so I had to get over like I usually don't like people to hear me sing you know and so like I had to get over that like I'm just singing with a four-year-old they don't care <laughs> you know <laughs> uh I'll sometimes, you know, when I do, I don't always use a bassoon. It's not really practical <laughs> always to have a bassoon in, in a classroom with a bunch of four-year-olds. But when I do use the bassoon and I play some kind of song or something, you know, like I don't have to, they, they just love the sound of the bassoon. They don't care, <laughs> you know, so I can, I can pull something out, you know, that maybe I'm working on and like, you know, play through something and just like have that experience of like um, playing for an audience that's not really you know, they're not judging me. <laughs> right. Um, so other things, um, I think um, yoga has been a huge help and just really um, taking care of myself, like in terms of um, like both mentally and physically, um, just kind of that, the mindfulness, stretching and breathing. Um, and then depending on the situation, just like pre-performance rituals, I try to either like kind of just get pumped up maybe with like some dancing like with uh, some music and like try to get some of that nervous energy out yes. and like kind of like have fun uh -huh. um or maybe it's like I'm doing like breathing techniques or or something like that to really calm the system and try to to get the focus happening so yeah um I think now in many ways it's less physical uh for me when I have mm -hmm. performing performance anxiety um it I think now it it's like a lot more of a mental game mm -hmm. like getting out of my head and um getting over that the the, the internal conversation yes and like trying to trying to stay focused on what what you're doing so Stacy, is there any advice that you can share for musicians just starting out their music careers Oh, um, I would say be open, be flexible. Uh, things are not always going to go the way that you think, um, but have goals um, and think about where it is that you want to be. Um, I think I could have done a lot more of that. Sometimes I, I'm very much kind of like a go with the flow kind of person. That's like, well, let's see where this goes. <laughs> what? <laughs> I guess I'm going to do this thing and let's see what happens. Yeah. And I think that's you know, and that's good to a certain extent, but at the same time, sometimes I wish, like, okay, why am I still doing this thing, like, that, like, I could have started doing this thing that I want to do, like, maybe five years ago, and I didn't, like, you know, make it happen. It's like, why am I still talking about wanting to do that thing? Why am I not doing it? <laughs> you know, so, like, having a little bit of that structure of, like, this is how you can get to a, a certain point. Like, this is mm -hmm. how you can achieve a certain goal. Um, I, th I think that, you know, maybe a good example would be like double tonguing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's like, well, that's one of those things that like, you know, you have to, to make sure that you set those goals and you have to keep at after it and keep doing it for a certain amount of time. And you can keep saying that you're going to do it. You can keep saying that you're going to do it. And then a year later, you haven't done it yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so that's my advice to you, young students. Make sure you practice your double tonguing. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, but so flexibility, but also um, structure, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Finding that balance. Um, and then I would also um, just say, thinking about what is it, like what's your, your definition of success and quality of life? Um, and don't accept things that are, that are going to make, put you in a toxic environment or, you know, put you in a, in a situation where you're um, going to, where it starts taking a, a toll on your quality of life or your mental health. Um, and I think, you know, I've, I've gone through several different, um, jobs where it's been like, okay, I need to. I'm going to step away from this one. Like, this is mm -hmm. not what mm -hmm. I want to be doing. 
Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, it may seem like, you know, that was, that was one hard thing about stepping away from my job at SFA um, and moving back to Chattanooga. Um, it, you know, it was, it was a hard decision, but ultimately it was definitely the right one. <laughs> uh -huh. you know? Um, and so, you know, sometimes you have to trust your gut and, and, and when, when it tells you to get out, get out. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful, Stacy. Yeah. Is there anyone that you would be interested to see interviewed next for this project? Let's see. Well, there's all of these amazing women on the cover of this, uh, Meg Quickly competition. Wow. <laughs> what about, let's see, Midori Sampson, have you interviewed her yet? I'd love to meet, reach out to Midori. Yeah. I have not gotten to meet her yet, so would love that. Yeah. Stacy, thank you so much for sharing this interview. It's wonderful to get a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. For everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for two events held every week on the Music Link. Every Thursday Central Daylight Time, a new YouTube video launches, and every Sunday Central Daylight Time, a live Zoom group discussion is hosted by the interviewed guest. Check out Stacy's hosting session coming up this Sunday, where she's sharing about important community engagement resources, all about teaching artists and how to choose appropriate programming and what discussions to share around music education, more about what early learners need from community outreach and important skills and professional development opportunities to explore. More about knowing that it's okay to say no, what it is like working on the administrative side of an orchestra, and so much more. Find out more about Stacy and her work at the Scenic City Bassoons website and feel free to reach out to her anytime she would love to hear from you. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and we'd be happy to incorporate these in the live discussion. Please subscribe to this channel and turn on the bell for notifications, which really helps keep the music link moving forward. The music link is a New Zealand-based resource for people around the world to share, learn, and connect through music. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video.